Okay, so hi everyone. Um, as, uh, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Jane Grohl. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the DevOps Institute. Uh, I'm based out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, and I'm particularly excited to be with you in Brazil today. In fact, before the pandemic, it was one of the countries that I was intending to visit. Uh, this year, knowing that there's such a large DevOps community here. So while I can't be with you in person, I certainly am very excited to be with you uh, virtually, and thank you for having me. Today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, we're not going to talk about technology in the truest sense of the word. We're going to look at human transformation, and I'm going to share with you some data that DevOps Institute has collected two years in a row about skills. Which skills are considered the uh, must-have skills, most essential skills, which are nice-to-have skills, and which skills are now no longer important across several categories of, of IT technical skills. So I'm excited to share with you some of that data. Uh, and then I'm hoping at the end, if you have any questions for me, that I'll be able to answer those for you. So a little bit about DevOps Institute, if you're not familiar with us, we're a global member community. Our mission is to advance the human elements of DevOps. There are a lot of, of communities that have risen up about technology, uh, but we really do feel that it is the human uh, across the entire world that's going to really drive uh, transformation. And so our mission is to equip you with skills in the form of certification, knowledge in the form of research, hopefully situations like this where we can share some ideas and then ongoing opportunities for uh, for you to learn. So if you're not already, membership in DevOps Institute is free. So go up to devopsinstitute.com, click join. Uh, again, we're not going to ask you for your credit card. It is a free community today. Um, and then you'll be able to access our research. We do a monthly conference uh, known as Skill Up Days. I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end. Uh, there's opportunities to connect with other folks in the community. Uh, really across the world, many of whom are, are faced with the same challenges that uh, you're likely facing in your own organization. So let's start our story by acknowledging that 2020 has been a very unique year to say the least. The world shifted very, very suddenly and very drastically with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And never before in my lifetime have I seen the entire world shut down, right? The entire world have to very quickly move from a very traditional environment where people went to an office every day, uh, they knew what their work was, they knew who they worked for, to a, a very remote workforce. And, and what's, I think, particularly interesting about this year is that it didn't affect necessarily one country or one region. It really did affect the entire world. And we're so grateful to the healthcare providers, to the people that deliver your groceries, to the essential workers that are helping us through this terrible, terrible pandemic. But I'm going to tell you that the unsung heroes of the global pandemic is really the tech community. So if you work in IT, chances are good that you not only had to shift the way that you worked, but you also had to shift the way that your organization works. And so many of us had to very, very quickly go from uh, an environment that we were very familiar with. Maybe you were in the cloud, maybe you weren't in the cloud, um, but all of a sudden having to support potentially a very large remote workforce. And, and, and again, it was very rapid. It was very, very dramatic. Now we know coming out of this, and we don't know when that's going to be, right? I'm in Florida, and I will tell you that right now, Florida has seen such a surge in the number of cases that our children are not going back to live school in the fall. Uh, people are not going back to their offices anymore, travel. Uh, last year, I was on an airplane every month. This year, I haven't been on an airplane since December. So whenever we come out of this, we're not going back 
to the way that it was. And we know that, right? We know that organizations are learning. We know that there will be a new normal. And the reality is one thing that enterprises learn throughout this whole situation is that digital transformation is no longer an option. So organizations that might have been uh, trying to transform more slowly, or maybe they didn't think they needed to transform, but the, the organizations that were the most successful in this, in this environment were those that had a digital footprint, right? You see Amazon, uh, whose you know, who's delivery business has just boomed. You see organizations that had a strong online presence, uh, you know, not see as much of a decline economically as organizations here in the United States, some major retailers are gonna go out of business uh, because they couldn't and they didn't take digital transformation as serious as they could. And so in order for organizations to transform, to really move forward and become digital enterprises, they're going to need new talent. And they're going to need the existing talent to be upskilled, cross-skilled. And we know that in many cases, because so many people have lost their jobs, that reskilling is likely going to be something that uh, becomes part of the new normal. And so that's great, right? Everybody has an opportunity to learn new skills, to grow their careers, uh, the tech community. Um, will be in high demand. There was a, a huge talent gap before uh, the pandemic, but the question has to be which skills, right? How do you know which skills are going to be the most important to your organization and the most important to your career? And there's not a single answer, right? There's not a, a single skill that's going to guarantee you a promotion or guarantee your organization success or guarantee you a job. So that's something that we're going to look at a little bit today. So every year, DevOps Institute conducts a very large community project. Uh, in fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to announce the survey for the 2021 report. So for two years in a row, we've um, really initiated a research project known as Upskilling, the Enterprise DevOps Skills Survey. And we put it out to the whole world and ask a pretty deep uh, series of questions about which skills across several categories are considered must have, nice to have, and not as important. And then we break that down based on what level uh, the organization replied and start to look at patterns. This project is led by our research director, Evelyn Orlick, who was a vice president at Forrester Research for many, many years. So uh, now two years in a row, we're starting to see some patterns. As I said, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to announce uh, the opening of the new survey. And I really hope for those of you listening that you'll take a few minutes and complete the survey for us so that we start to get more and more information and we can analyze that data, uh, particularly because this has been such a unique year. So I'm gonna share with you some of the data from the 2020 report. Just to give you an idea of how this report is accepted, we, launched, we published the report. So we always end the survey in December. We published the report in March. We've had 3,100 downloads of the report so far. Now, again, just to give you some context, this report is 60 pages, right? So there's a lot of data inside this report. Do you need to read it all? No. Do you need to pull out the parts that are relevant to you? Yes. And I said, I'm going to give you a high level overview of that today. And I encourage you, you can download the report for free from the DevOps Institute. So not surprisingly, 52% of the respondents, and we had uh, just about 1,300 respondents across the world last year, 52% said that the DevOps journey is difficult. That's not a huge surprise. Transformation is never easy. I think what's particularly surprising here is that it was almost equally difficult from a people perspective, a cultural perspective, a process perspective, and a technology perspective. So it wasn't like one side of this was easier than the other. They were almost equally difficult. And these are the three key elements of transformation. You do need people, you do need intelligent process, and of course you need automation uh, to perform some of those manual tasks. 
And so prior to the pandemic, because you have to remember the data was collected uh, as of December, and at least here in the US, the pandemic really uh, took hold in March, 52% uh, of the respondents said they were actively recruiting or planning to hire within the next 12 months. So that's a huge number of, of individuals and organizations that are looking for the talent that we call the DevOps human that this new set of skills that builds on your, your current skills are very, very much in demand. And, and you'll see, we'll see some of that across different regions. What was disappointing out of the data is that only 31% said that their organizations have a formal upskilling program. So there are some high level organizations that very publicly announced uh, investments in upskilling. Amazon had announced a $700 million investment. FedEx had announced a, a large investment. But only 31% of our respondents said that their organization has a formal upskilling uh, program. But another 20% are looking at developing it. So they're currently in the process of developing a program. 38% said they didn't. Now, again, I'll be really interested next year to see when we collect the data from 2020, whether this number changes at all. Uh, I'm hoping that it does, because we know that organizations need to invest in uh, creating programs for their employees so that uh, you can grow. Now, the other interesting thing about this data is when you look at the categories of skills, that uh, we collect information about. Three skills, three categories of skills have come out just about equal in terms of their, their being critical. Process skills and knowledge, human skills, uh, you might call those soft skills. Uh, we don't think they're so soft, we think they're hard. So we call them human skills and automation skills. So for two years in a row, those three categories of skills came out equally important in terms of must-have skills. And then you can work your way down to functional skills. We'll take a, a little bit of a look at that. Business skills, specific automation, or specific certification. But I really want you to keep in mind process, human, and automation as we go through this today. The other interesting part of the process, the human and the automation, was the agreement of certain levels within the organization. So if you look at the C-level, the executive level, you look at the management level, and the, and the management level could be a director, could be a manager, could be a senior manager. They're usually the, the, the folks that are managing directly, right? And they're also usually the folks that are hiring. So they are the, the, the layer of the organization that has the direct relationship with the employee. Um, then we look at the individual contributor. You might think of that as a practitioner, right? Somebody who works under a manager or a director and then the contractor. So we were able to segment out the respondents in terms of, of which layer they, they sat in. And, and I said really interesting because for process skills, absolute agreement across all four levels, right? All four levels uh, recognize that you have to have intelligent process. And, and we'll take a look at that in order to have intelligent organizations and also to have a good culture, right? There's a little bit of a difference in the human and the automation skills where the management layer felt uh, a little bit more strongly about how essential those skills are, but still there's not a lot of difference between say the executives and the managers in terms of human skills and automation skills are very, very important in terms of what they're looking for in their uh, DevOps human, in their, in their DevOps talent. So keep that in mind as, as we go a lot of times in DevOps, we talk a lot about automation and automation is important. And we talk a lot about your technical skills and your technical skills are important. They're not the most important, right? You need to think about your, your human to human skills, your collaborative skills, and certainly a, a recognition of the importance of process. And again, well, let, let's take a little bit of a deeper look at that. So from a human skill um, perspective, uh, again, I don't think it's a huge surprise 
that collaboration and cooperation uh, is considered the number one human to human skill, right? You would have called it a soft skill. Your ability to work with others, your ability to cooperate with others, but more important than that, your ability to respect somebody else's opinion, to ask for their opinion, to uh, respect their expertise, to ask for their expertise, and to have them respect and ask you as well. So it is almost like the interoperability between, between people. And it, it doesn't reflect on whether you're friendly or not. It, it's how comfortable you are, including somebody else or asking for their opinion um, or just working with them, right? Collaboration is very much a two-way relationship as is cooperation. And this is important because we have to break down those silos. And then you, you keep going down the list and you'll see your interpersonal skills, right? Your relationship skills, your problem solving skills, right? Your, your willingness to share your, your knowledge. And then even going a little bit further down, Empathy. You know, there's a lot of talk in, in, in the DevOps space about empathy, where empathy is where you look at the world or you look at a situation through somebody else's eyes, right? They, there's a term, you walk in their shoes, right? So you're actually looking at it from their perspective and you're empathizing with their situation, with their approach. Um, and, and so by being able to do that, there's kind of a shared mentality that goes with that inclusiveness, same thing. So the, all of these skills are really important. And I think in the past, we assume that you either had them or you didn't, right? You were either friendly or you weren't. Uh, you've probably figured out I'm a, I'm a little bit of an extrovert. So um, it's something that I'm born with. And it, and it has nothing, this has nothing to do with whether you're, you like to be quiet or you don't. These are skills that your organization can provide training on. There's peer-to-peer -peer mentoring about, and there's skills that you can practice. So I said, look at the data. Don't undervalue the, the need for you to have good collaboration skills, good problem-solving skills, and a willingness to, to share your, your knowledge. So if you look at this from a collaborative DevOps human, so what we're doing here is we're trying to encourage you to be a DevOps human. And a DevOps human is a complex ecosystem, right? And so we want to be able to have you be or work with transformational servant leaders. So maybe uh, you took some agile training maybe you're a scrum master, you know what the concept of a servant leader is, right? Servant leader is one that, that serves the organization that, that uh, removes obstacles for, uh, for, the, for the team, right? We're calling uh, this role a transformational servant leader, which means that leader inspires as well as uh, protects. And, and regardless of your title or your role, you're a transformational servant leader if you choose to be one because you're not going to issue directives and your manager is not going to give you direction, right? They're going to inspire you to be able to do your own work. And then the other part of the culture that, that DevOps very much encouraged is, is a learning culture. One where failure is an opportunity to learn, right? There's a, a concept of fail mindfully. So we don't want you to fail, but if you do, let's learn from that. Let's understand instead of, of imposing punishment, uh, which has been in the past, right? Blame, which is never productive. So that's human skills. And now I want to take a little bit of a look at, at functional skills. And there's some, a little bit of interesting uh, data that goes here. So last year, uh, IT operations and IT infrastructure knowledge were the top two must-have essential skills. And they still are. I mean, obviously, they're still very, very strong in terms of what kind of skills do you need to have. But there's been a, a, a switch from the year before, and that's that security is now in the top role. Granted, it's a tie with IT operations. What you, what you may not know is that of the people that filled out the survey, half of them self-identified as being in development, just about half. Half of them uh, identified as being in operations or security. So we have a fairly good split 
between development, operations, and security across different levels to be able to, to say that this data is actually good data. So you all need to learn a little bit about security, right? DevSecOps is, is very much on the rise. It's, it's trending very heavily where security is everybody's responsibility and that we want to build in security earlier in the pipeline. Um, and in order to do that, every DevOps engineer, every DevOps human has to have some type of security skills. Now, you don't have to be a security expert, but if you're a developer, you need to know how to write your code, you need to know how to build your code, you need to know how to secure your code, at least at the, at, at the coding level. And then of course there are security professionals that will look at more vulnerabilities and, and, and threats. So everybody has to learn a little bit about DevOps and, and DevSecOps, right? Everybody has to learn a little bit about security practices so that you have just enough of that knowledge in order to be functional. Also on a team level, uh, we're now talking about hybrid product teams where product teams are no longer just uh, filled with uh, developers. A hybrid team now has operations folks, SREs, uh, security professionals, all in a multi-skilled hybrid uh, environment. And everybody on the team has a little bit of that experience. So operations absolutely kind of rose to the top, but, but you know, you can see application development, uh, you know, right behind that in terms of these are the must have skills. You need to know about this. Again, you don't have to be an expert, but you need to understand uh, current application development life cycle approaches, maybe scrum right or uh, or scaled agile you need to know enough about provisioning infrastructure about reliability it's one of the things i love about site reliability engineering and then everybody needs to understand uh have some some skills in security this hybrid product team is really a key pillar of transformation because in the past and i've been in it a fairly long time in the past the team was isolated. So the scrum teams were mostly developers. Uh, maybe you had a, a quality assurance person on the team, but it was mostly um, teams of development that were producing code, that were producing some iteration or some increment uh, of, a, of a product. But today, as we move forward, those teams, when you look at some of the different models, are multi-skilled. So not only do you have somebody that has operations knowledge or security knowledge on the team, you as a member of the team have some of those skills as well. At least you know enough to be able to apply it to whatever work you do. All right, again, you don't have to be an expert. The other thing about this hybrid product team is that everybody shares their metrics. So the accountability is shared among the team. So we all win together or we all lose together but what we're gonna measure is customer value. And, and that's obviously very, very, very important. And we can talk more about observability and looking at the outside on the way in, but it's important to understand that the focus on value has never been stronger than it is today. So we've looked at human skills, we've looked at functional skills, we know that the number one set of skills that are considered essential are process. But if you look at this, this chart, you'll notice that some of the process frameworks that maybe you're familiar with, like ITIL, isn't on the list. So it's not like you need to become an ITIL expert. Um, you need to understand flow. And so process, intelligent process, sits under intelligent automation. You can't have intelligent automation if we are not um, really building process that sits underneath it, that replicates what a human would do. So number one uh, process uh, must have skill is source control followed very closely by flow. The ability to analyze flow, that could be a value stream map, it could be a flow chart, it can, you know, there's lots of different ways to look at where are the, the, the skills that are necessary to be able to analyze how our software delivery mechanisms, how our continuous delivery 
uh, pipelines are delivering a uh, flow. And then like before, we saw operations very high. Now we start to see software development life cycle in the third position. We, so we see a very strong presence that everybody needs to understand SDLC um, in order to be a part of that life cycle, to be part of the pipelines, and, and to certainly understand the, um, uh, the acceleration that we're looking to happen. Uh, then we look at Agile, but that's not necessarily Scrum. Scrum is further down the list. And then you, you know, you move forward with testing, understanding processes of testing, you know, good best practices in testing, including test-driven development. So if you're a developer, uh, you not only need to understand security, you need to understand testing now. But one of, you know, the last three are kind of my favorites only because they've just shown up this year, but they're rising very, very quickly. They're very hot topics. Uh, SRE, I heard SRE mentioned uh, before my introduction, it is an area that I'm particularly excited about because I think that it's um, service management. So if you've done ITIL, I think SRE is a much more modern approach to that. But I also think focusing on operations, life after, you know, after deployment is important. I also love the, that fact that design thinking and value stream mapping um, while still in the early stages at the enterprise are now being considered must have skills. I think the difference with SRE is that SRE is a real job. And when we start to see the acceleration of SRE, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, you know, Agile's had a lot longer to, to enter into the enterprise uh, from, you know, 2001 uh, now, and of course over the last, say, five or six years. Same thing with DevOps. DevOps just passed 11 years since, uh, you know, DevOps first entered uh, into the IT, you know, into the IT environment. SRE is only a few years old, and this year we saw a big rise in organizations that are hiring SREs, that uh, SRE practices are, are really uh, trending very, very quickly. So again, if you're in operations, I would challenge you to learn a little bit about SRE. Uh, and again, our partners at Quote can help with some of those certifications around SRE and DevSecOps. Now, technically, there's been a little bit of a change this year. And so if you're a DevOps engineer, or you're an automation architect, or, or you have a, a technical role, last year, cloud and cloud platforms uh, really were at the top of the must-have skills uh, far away from any other skill. So it really was cloud, 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 and cloud. This year, interestingly enough, CI, CD tool chains uh, overtook cloud, not by a lot, but certainly uh, emerged as the top set of technical skills that uh, anyone in engineering needs to understand. Again, whether you're in software engineering, maybe you're in infrastructure engineering or site reliability engineering, understanding the CI, CD ecosystem or the tool chains that are associated with it and the ability to manage, to architect, uh, many of those tools are open source. Uh, you know, APIs are the, are the number three position because when you're building pipelines, you're more likely going to build them with, uh, with APIs. So from a technical perspective, the message here is your, your continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment tools are an area of focus if, if you're anywhere near a technology job right, or helping your organization grow. The movement to the cloud and cloud native is certainly uh, happening very quickly. And I think the pandemic will push that a lot uh, faster forward. Uh, but again, a lot of organizations are hybrid or they're still on premise. Uh, regardless, really being able to understand what those CI, CD tools are and how to, how to interface them with APIs is important. And then, you know, if you kind of work your way down, analytics. So we're looking at AI, we're looking at machine learning, uh, certainly uh, observability. So the ability not only to monitor, but to really be able to look at analytics and make sense of it, I think is, is pretty important. As we've kind of moved through the ages, particularly in IT, and I said I've been in IT a fairly long time. I'm not going to tell you how long, but it's a pretty long time. 
you know, when we grew IT up from an enterprise, we wanted everybody to be a specialist, right? So you identified as a developer or maybe you were an infrastructure person or maybe you were a systems administrator or maybe you were an operations or a support person. IT is very complex, we're like a tree, right? Where the trunk of the tree is the business and the branches of IT sometimes don't even see each other because we're not even in the same region. And so for a period of time that worked, we needed to mature so that we had all the right skills in all the right places, but with transformation, it's not enough. With transformation, you still wanna be a specialist, you still wanna be a software engineer, or you wanna be an infrastructure engineer, and if you're a manager, of course, you wanna be able to lead your team, but you need to add uh, more of a broad general knowledge. As I've said before, everybody needs to learn about something about security, something about testing, right? You need to be able to grow your human skills. Certainly you need to look at your process skills, uh, you know, your flow, your source control, uh, understanding the processes that, uh, that really help you manage services. So last year, we, we wanted you to be T-shaped. We wanted you to keep growing your specialty, but add other skills uh, at a very broad level to what we call the top of your T, so that uh, you were cross-skilled, but um, everything in the top of your T really supported your specialty. Well, this year we've taken it even a step further and said the top of your T has to focus on your human skills. And again, please do not undervalue how important culture is to DevOps. It is culture and the way humans behave and the way humans perceive their work that is actually transformative. So the top of your T we think should be your human skills. The stem of your T, your specialty, really does need to be about process. Because if you're a software engineer, how you build software is a process. If you're a DevOps engineer, how you architect your pipelines is a process, right? Multiple processes, <coughs> excuse me. So human skills and process skills are really essential. And of course, within that, you're gonna look at technical skills, automation. You're gonna look at functional skills like security or IT infrastructure or software delivery. Uh, and of course, you're gonna look at your technical skills, your familiarity with tools and with cloud and with cloud na uh, native and Kubernetes and, and all of the other patterns that are starting to emerge on a technical side. And how you're gonna grow is through experience, right? One of the things I love about DevOps is that we encourage you to explore. We encourage you to experiment, safe experimentation, right? Uh, but we encourage that type of approach that says you only become a master if you practice. And so, you know, as, as a DevOps human, you need to feel comfortable doing that, again, in a safe way. But you need to be comfortable because that's where innovation is, is born. And of course, the, the way to become an expert is through execution. So you're going to explore, you're gonna experiment, and of course, uh, as you start to execute and see the results, hopefully very positive results, you will grow into this E-shape person. Now, it doesn't matter what letter of the alphabet we use, right? Um, the message is a strong message that you're not going to grow your career purely through your automation skills. Your organization is not gonna transform uh, purely through your automation skills. You can't buy DevOps, really what the message is. You can't buy DevOps. In fact, if you really think about what DevOps is, it's really a set of principles. And the only way to get DevOps is to, is to like any good recipe, add good ingredients to it. It is people that are going to make the biz biggest difference. You know, you, you've heard me use the term human a lot. Um, at DevOps Institute, we choose the word human because it doesn't matter if you're sitting in Brazil or Florida or India or Europe. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter any of the other characteristics of who we are. At least today, we're all human. And so it is, it, it is becoming clear that human transformation 
is as important, if not more important, than digital transformation. You can't get one without the other. So it's going to be the individuals that are gonna skill themselves up and challenge the organization to do new things through these new skills. Our leaders are gonna become transformational servants. So they're gonna protect the team, but they're going to inspire the team to work differently, to look at things differently, to change the organization to adapt to market trends. And then of course, it's going to be the organization that's gonna foster all of that. They're going to foster learning. They're going to try to grow their existing staff. It's a lot less expensive to keep an existing staff member than it is to hire a new one. And they're gonna shift their metrics to value, right? How do you know what value we're delivering to the end customer? if we're not able to measure it. And uptime is not necessarily the only metric, right? So, uh, so we need to be, you know, an MTTR, if you're familiar with MTTR, right? Mean time to repair is not the only way that IT should be, uh, should be challenged. So I hope some of this data gives you some ideas in terms of what do you need to do personally? Which skills do you think you need to start uh, learning about grooming uh, based on your role. Which skills do you go to your manager, your director, your CIO, and suggest be added to an upskilling program? And then, you know, we can only change ourselves. We can't change anybody else. So how do we set out on a journey that makes us from where we are today to truly a hybrid DevOps human? So again, I invite you to go up to the DevOps Institute website to become a member. Again, it's free. Uh, we don't ask for a lot of your personal information, but there are a lot of good assets uh, that, you can, uh, that you can get up there. We have skill up minutes, we have podcasts, uh, <coughs> but this report is really our flagship. This is the report that we do every year because we think it serves the humans at DevOps. Uh, more in, in a different way than some of the other uh, surveys. So you're welcome to go up to the website and download the report for free and talk about it with your manager, talk about it with your colleagues, see where you agree, see where you disagree. It's a great opportunity. And, and as I said, uh, I think it's on August 20th, we're going to announce the opening of the survey for the next uh, report. So please take a few minutes if you see that on social media and, and complete the survey. It's really important data that we share with the whole world. And then I'm gonna leave you with uh, an invitation. So every month, uh, DevOps Institute holds a full conference for a single day called Skill Up Days. And so we invite uh, industry thought leaders and we take a, a very specific topic uh, last month was continuous delivery ecosystems. This uh, month coming up, August, is observability. September will be DevSecOps. It's not a class. Uh, we have uh, about six or seven speakers. We do some panels. Uh, there's an exhibit floor. You can go visit uh, sponsors. Uh, and I think most importantly, there's a really nice network channel, uh, lounge that you can chat with each other. So again, go up to the website, become a member, but sign up for skill up days. They're free. Um, and so far, uh, feedback on them have been really fascinating um, and really fantastic. It, it, is, it is a really nice platform. So I would like to say, Obrigado and uh, obrigada, because I'm a woman, right? So forgive me for my terrible Portuguese, uh, but that's about as far as I got <laughs> today. So with that, I'm open if you have any questions. Thank you, Janie. Obrigada, so obrigada that, that's right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great lecture. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, I, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. Sure. Uh, do you think that people from uh, operation or infrastructure teams are resistant to adopting DevOps, SRE, or Agile culture? Do you think that, that uh, there are resistance? So I think a few years ago, maybe. I think that when we saw, so I've been in the DevOps space now uh, about eight years. So in the early yeah. days, it always felt like the, the, 
people that were more involved in DevOps were uh, either developers or maybe some operations, but early. So the people that built or tested or released. And, and the rest of us, I come from operations, the rest of us didn't really see ourselves as part of DevOps. And I think SRE has changed that. I think SRE has shown us that while DevOps focuses on uh, delivery or deployment, that SRE focuses on operations, but also engages the developers, engages uh, folks before. And I think even more importantly, SRE is a real job. So if you're in operations and you're looking at your career, uh, you know, looking at site reliability engineer as a job, it is the fifth fastest growing job, according to LinkedIn. So, uh, so if they are concerned about, you know, where they fit in DevOps, DevOps is going to happen. It, it, it's going to happen, whether people like it or not. It's right. It's a lead, follow, or get out of the way. But if, if anyone from operations is concerned about it, I would absolutely learn a lot more about SRA. In fact, it's difficult to think in, in uh, agile delivery uh, without DevOps, without uh, SRE. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, so in Brazil, uh, it, it's uh, great cases, uh, DevOps great cases, but the most of companies start in DevOps journey uh, with tools. Of course. For the tools. Okay. Yeah, of course. How to engage the C level? How to make them understand that DevOps culture is much more than tools, is much more than, than the uh, technology guy. So it's it's funny you say that. So even here in the U.S., many organizations started with tools and they failed. Right? They found out that. It wasn't enough. It didn't get them the, the results that they were looking for because the tools were not enough. And, and, you know, sometimes we talk about culture like we talk about surgery, right? That we could go into an organization and we can cut out the old culture and then attach a new culture and tell everybody starting Monday, we're going to do things differently and all the humans are going to cheer. It doesn't happen that way, right? It doesn't happen that way. And so culture is something, culture doesn't transform, people transform. And people transform because they do get to learn and they do get to experiment. So I think that organizations that start with tools are gonna to find out very quickly that if they didn't focus on, on the process, and, the, and of course the only one that really exercises process are people, so they didn't look at people, process, and automation equally, that they didn't succeed. There's some great case studies in the US and in Europe in particular of organ there's a company out of the Netherlands that transformed the whole business and a large insurance company uh, to, to look at the Spotify squad model. Now, was it perfect? No, but they chose to kind of shift the culture in a very different way and make people work together. Right, and, and they had to figure it out. So I, I think that it's natural that the first thing we do is try to get tools. That's IT, that's right. I, I mean, my life too, we solve problems by adding technology, right? We solve tools, you know, we go and we buy stuff. Um, but, but organizations are finding out they can only get so far and then, and, and then they have to start looking at the cultural side of things.